Hydroxyurea works by inhibiting ribonucleotide reductase, blocking DNA synthesis during the S phase. It has efficacy in melanoma and CML. Didn't we talk about hydroxyurea before? Wasn't it used in sickle cell disease? Well, in fact, in sickle cell disease, hydroxyurea works because it increases fetal hemoglobin, which alleviates the symptoms associated with excess hemoglobin S. The toxicities here are the same as most of the drugs we've discussed, bone marrow suppression, and GI upset. Prednisone and prednisolone are both glucocorticoids that work by triggering apoptosis. They are unique among the cancer drugs in that they even work on non-dividing cells. These are used in CLL, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, as well as autoimmune diseases. Toxicities include Cushing-like symptoms. Let's see what you recall from endocrinology. What are some signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome? Some would be weight gain, increased hunger, central obesity with limb sparing, moon face, and purple striae, to name a few. Other adverse effects include immunosuppression, which might give you some clue as to why these drugs may be used in autoimmune disorders, cataracts, acne, hypertension, hyperglycemia, peptic ulcers, psychosis, and osteoporosis. Do you recall what other drug we just discussed that can cause osteoporosis? That would be heparin. Heparin also causes osteoporosis. Tamoxifen and raloxifene are selective estrogen receptor modulators, or SERMs, that block estrogen receptors in the breast and activate them in the bone. Thus, they are effective in estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, meaning that they block estrogen's pro-growth effect in the breast tissue. They also have the added benefit of preventing osteoporosis because they promote bone growth. Tamoxifen has a partial agonist effect on endometrial cells and has what commonly tested effect on the risk of endometrial carcinoma. That would increase our risk of endometrial carcinoma. Unlike tamoxifen, raloxifene is an endometrial estrogen receptor antagonist, so it does not increase the risk of endometrial carcinoma. To summarize, tamoxifen and raloxifene both block estrogen receptors in the breast and stimulate estrogen receptors in the bone. However, they differ in that tamoxifen stimulates estrogen receptors in the endometrium, while raloxifene blocks estrogen receptors in the endometrium. We'll talk about these two again in repro, so keep your eye out for them. Now let's talk about a few targeted cancer therapies. Unlike many of the drugs that we've discussed before, these drugs work specifically on cancer cells and try to distinguish them from normal healthy cells. For example, trastuzumab, or Herceptin, is a drug that doesn't just target rapidly dividing cells, it actually targets cancer cells with a specific mutation. Trastuzumab is effective in some kinds of breast cancer, and do you know what mutation is the target in this therapy? Well, certain breast cancers overexpress HER2, which stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2, and is a tyrosine kinase receptor. Trastuzumab targets HER2 specifically and is effective in metastatic breast cancers that are HER2 positive. The well-known and sometimes tested toxicity of trastuzumab is cardiotoxicity. What are the other anti-tumor drugs that we've discussed that are well-known for cardiotoxicity? Well, doxorubicin and donorubicin are the two big ones. As we discussed earlier, imatinib targets the constitutively active tyrosine kinase expressed by the Philadelphia chromosome in CML. It also targets CKIT, which is overactivated tyrosine kinase in many GI tumors. This drug is extremely efficacious in CML and GI stromal tumors. In terms of side effects, imatinib can cause fluid retention in some patients. Rituzumab is a monoclonal antibody against CD20, which is found on most neoplastic B cells. Not surprisingly, then, rituximab is effective in treating B cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. It is also used in rheumatoid arthritis in combination with methotrexate and is associated with an increased risk of PML after use. Femurafenib inhibits the BRAF kinase with the V600E mutation that causes melanoma. It is used for metastatic melanoma. Bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody against VEGF, which is a factor necessary for angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is necessary for virtually all solid tumors to maintain a blood supply for growth. Therefore, bevacizumab can be used for a broad range of solid tumors. 
Now for something a little more fun than learning about drug mechanisms, allow me to introduce you to Chemotox Man! Chemotox Man aptly illustrates the major toxicities of various cancer drugs. Pay close attention to the shape of various markings on its body because they spell out the first letter of most drugs that have toxicities corresponding to that region of the body. This diagram is very helpful for the boards. Up top you may notice a large, very round head. What chemo drug can you think of that is not represented by a letter in Chemotox Man that could do this? How about the moon face that many people get under the use of prednisone? I think he may have also gained a little weight since the last time we saw him, but those arms and legs do look pretty skinny. Note that his ears are shaped like C's, as well as his two kidneys. Note also that there are two of each of these. What do these stand for? These are for cisplatin and carboplatin, since they both cause nephrotoxicity and acoustic nerve damage. Next up, we note all the extremities are shaped like V's. This is for vincristine, which causes that peripheral neuropathy with paresthesias. Then we note the lungs are two large B's. What could these be representing? These B's denote pulmonary fibrosis, caused by bleomycin as well as busulfan. Sandwiched between our B's for lungs is one big D that represents a heart. What does this stand for? This actually represents both doxorubicin and donorubicin, causing cardiotoxicity. We also note that there is a small T inside the heart. This is for trastuzumab, causing cardiotoxicity. Down in our nether regions here, we note a C combined with a Y. This represents hemorrhagic cystitis associated with cyclophosphamide. Finally, the bones are capped with 5, 6, and M. What class of drugs does this make us think of? That's the anti-metabolites, representing 5-fluorouracil, 6-mercaptopurine, 6-thioguanine, and methotrexate, all of which lead to myelosuppression in the bone marrow. Many of these side effects are very commonly tested on your exams. As you can see, Chemotox Man does a great job of associating all of these side effects into one good picture. If you're a visual learner, I really recommend that you try and use this technique to get these down. This guy is extremely handy for your boards, and that's why he is so lovingly referred to as Chemotox Man. Okay, let's do our final USMLE style question in the Hematology and Oncology chapter. A 32-year-old man comes into the clinic for evaluation of a testicular mass that he first noticed on self-examination several months ago. He is found to have testicular cancer and begins chemotherapy. He subsequently develops shortness of breath. Pulmonary function testing reveals a restrictive lung disease pattern. Lung biopsy shows a diffuse increase of interstitial fibrous tissue. What is the mechanism of action of the chemotherapeutic agent most likely responsible for this complication? Crosslinks DNA during active and resting phases of the cell cycle induces formation of free radicals during the G2 phase of the cell cycle, inhibits dihydrofolate reductase in the S phase of the cell cycle, inhibits toporisomerase 2 in late S and early G2 phases of the cell cycle, stabilizes polymerized microtubules during the M phase of the cell cycle. The answer here is induces formation of free radicals during the G2 phase of the cell cycle. The key to this question was the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. There are only two drugs from our chemotox man that can cause pulmonary fibrosis. Both bleomycin and busulfan can cause pulmonary fibrosis. Knowing that this patient is under treatment for testicular cancer, it is more likely that the patient is receiving bleomycin than busulfan, as busulfan is used more in bone marrow transplant. Also, you may notice in your studies that some topics just come up over and over again. Even though there are two chemo drugs that cause pulmonary fibrosis, one is much more commonly tested, and that's bleomycin. So if you weren't sure which drug we were talking about, sometimes you may just have to go for the most commonly tested one. This is a test strategy you can use across all topics, and it's usually because the test makers are trying to hammer home a point that's clinically important in their field. So now that we've identified bleomycin, we need to identify the mechanism of bleomycin. From our cell cycle diagram, we can recall that bleomycin affects cells in the G2 phase by the formation of free radicals that bind and cause strand breaks in DNA. Bleomycin is used in the treatment of lymphomas and testicular cancers. Side effects also include pulmonary fibrosis, as well as skin pigment changes and myelosuppression. 
you can see that several of the studying strategies we discussed were used in this single question. And now that we've discussed all the mechanisms, this would be a great time to review the diagrams we saw for where each drug acts in the cell cycle, as well as our chemotox man, and really commit these to memory. The other mechanisms in the answer choices are in order cisplatin for A, methotrexate for C, etoposide for D, and paclitaxel for E. None of these treatments had the adverse effects of pulmonary fibrosis, as we see in the case presentation. Well, that'll wrap it up for the hematology and oncology section for this lecture series. I really hope you found these lectures useful in your studying, and be sure to come back if you feel that you need a refresher. Good luck on your exams.